in grade nine, my science class did a camping survival uh, weekend. And so we went out for three days into the forest and learned how to survive. We were allowed to bring a backpack. We could bring clothes. We, we brought our own food. We didn't have to eat the squirrels or hunt a moose. Um, but other than that, we weren't allowed to bring our own shelter. We had to build those. And we learned a lot about the forest, camping, um, etc. So when we got on, we all got on our bus, we drove out to the mountains, parked, and then our teacher took us on a, I'm going to say a three hour hike through the bush, which was really fun, only to end up 10 minutes from our uh, vans. So we were all, when we realized that, we were very frustrated with this teacher. But on this three hour walk, he would walk and take, he would stop and explain something about the forest to us, the trees, um, what mushrooms to eat and not eat, etc. On this trip, uh, this, this I think is very similar to how Jesus walked and talked with his disciples. I did look this up this week and a conservative estimate is that Jesus probably walked 5,000 kilometers during his ministry. If you kind of add it all together. 5,000 kilometers, that is more than the, the, that's actually almost the distance across Canada. Jesus walked that during his ministry and his disciples were brought along for the ride. But as Jesus would walk, he would also stop and talk with and teach his disciples. And so this morning, we're going to zoom in on one of those moments. This is following our, our passage from last week, and it's Mark 9, starting in verse 30. And Mark opens this passage by showing us that Jesus was completely and entirely aware of his impending death and resurrection. And because of that, he had to equip his disciples for ministry, for life, when he was gone. And so we will look at these skills that Jesus is teaching his disciples today, much like we had to go into the forest and learn our skills for survival. You're going to see as we continue through Mark, this latter half is, is really focused on teaching. And that's because Jesus knows he needs to get his disciples to a point where they can continue on this revolutionary um, movement that he is starting. And so going to Mark 9 verse 30, pull it up in your Bibles, follow along on the screen here. Mark writes, they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him and after three days he will rise. But they did not understand what he meant and were afraid to ask him about it. They came to Capernaum. When he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet on the way because they had argued about who was the greatest. Sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, Anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. He took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but welcomes the one who sent me. On this camping trip, we had to build our own shelters. So my friends and I got to work building ours, and I was not much of a survival camping expert, but they were scouts. Um, they were scouts members, so they actually knew what they were doing. And we found a fallen tree, gathered logs, and we made a shelter that looked a lot like this, but not as good. This is more professional than we could have done, and was a lot lower to the ground. So we were going to be very cozy in our little shelter. We took moss and we stuffed it in the cracks because this seemed like a good survival technique. But it made our shelter look really weird. And none of our classmates were doing anything even remotely like this. And we definitely stood out as the weird group. But across the clearing, there was a group of the cool kids. And they were building their shelter. And they managed to make their shelter look something like this. Maybe not as not as, once again, extravagant, but they were able to take their logs, form them in a way so that it actually looked like a tent. And they were the marvel of the camp. Everybody would, would walk by and want to go into their, tent, into their um, shelter. They wanted to see it. They were, they were the greatest. If you took a popular opinion poll, theirs was the greatest. And ours, people would walk by 
kind of mock and say, you're going to cuddle in there? And why is there all green and mossy? Ours was the insignificant one tossed to the side. As Jesus is, is talking with his disciples, um, he's realized that there is a major shift they need to make in their thinking as they're arguing with each other over who is the greatest. And so he begins to teach them how to honor the insignificant. So as they're walking, they're engaging in something that is so basic, so primal, and so innately human that we can't blame them. They're ranking each other. They're ranking each other probably based on ministry accolades. How many demons did you cast out last week? I brought this many people into following Jesus. This is something that is innately human. It's part of our survival instinct, to be honest. We want to be around people who are successful, who have the traits that are necessary for success, and so we rank people in order to try and figure that out. And then we go and gather around them. We hang out in their shelter. We be friends with them. Jesus sees this mindset at work in his disciples, and so he goes to set it straight. He sat down, assuming the posture of a teacher, meaning this is something important, it's about to be said, and says, if anyone wants to be first, they must be the very last, the servant of all. Jesus is a good teacher. He knows that these broad general statements like this sound good and they're, they're good platitudes, but they really sometimes um, miss the mark because they're too broad. And so he looks at the child, takes him into his arms, and then says, if you honor, if you, if you will honor this child the way that you would honor me, then you're also honoring my father. And this is what I want from you. Normally when I've read this, I've thought, okay, so this, this is elevating children to, to a higher level. We need, to, we need to respect children. We need to take care of our children. They're our future. But that's because I have this, this Western mentality that um, romanticizes or idealizes childhood, right? Disney's capitalizing on this hardcore by pulling up nostalgic movies from the past and making millions and millions of dollars on them. We think, oh, I would love to go back to be a child when I didn't have stress, when I didn't have responsibilities. But that isn't the way that children or childhood was viewed in Jesus' day. Children were actually viewed as insignificant. They were property of the father. They didn't have a voice until they were an adult. Really, they were kind of seen as a nuisance. And childhood was something you had to grow out of and not go back to. And so as he's telling his disciples this, He's really saying, you need to take those insignificant people, the ones who are at the bottom of society's ranking scale of significance, and honor them the way you would honor me. Maybe the best illustration to kind of push this forward is to say that Jesus, as he spoke, spoke in the language Aramaic, and in that language, servant and child are the same word. And this really just reinforces the point. Jesus is not speaking solely about kids here. He is saying anybody who is insignificant, treat them with the honor you would treat me. And in that way, you honor my father. He has flipped this, king, this ranking system on its head. This is where we get the idea that the kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. Where the last or the, most, the least significant are actually the most significant. So, seems simple. If you want to be great, if you want to be first, if you want to be prominent, go find the people who are insignificant and treat them with the honor you would treat Jesus. Now, you might have noticed the irony of that statement. And Jesus recognizes this too. He's not telling us a new way to get ahead of other people. He is completely revolutionizing the system of what it means to be important, prominent, and significant. He's tearing it down. He's addressing this utilitarian mindset we have that says, you are worth as much as you can do for me. This is innate in us. It's all a part of this ranking system. But he's turning that on its head. People are worth as much as God was willing to give for them. 
And how much was that? That was his life. He has set an equal playing field. The richest CEO and the meth addict lying in a gutter have the same value in God's eyes. This does not match with our societal ranking system. It doesn't match with how we innately think. But this is what Jesus is telling us. The most insignificant person in your life has the same value as the boss, as your spouse. And we are to treat them with the honor that we would show Jesus. Who in your life is seen as insignificant or cast off to the side? There's people in your workplace. There's people in your neighborhood. There's people in your social circles who do not rank as high. Who are they? My challenge to you is to invite them in. So look different depending on the situation. Maybe there's somebody at work who doesn't fit in and you have an opportunity to invite them for lunch. It might hurt your social ranking, but we don't need that system anymore. Treat them with honor. And in doing so, you honor Jesus and you honor the Father. I don't recommend that you necessarily do the same with somebody who is in the throes of addiction and living on the street. But you can volunteer with an organization that works to give dignity back to that individual. There are so many opportunities out there to honor those that our world sees as insignificant. A great example of this occurred before Christmas. My day job is I work at the Mustard Seed, which is a homeless shelter here in town. And there's a bar down the street from us that as a Christmas gift to mustard seed clients, to the homeless, those who, who just have nothing in the holidays, they opened their doors and they served them a meal. But this was different than the meals they would normally have been served if they went to a shelter where you line up and there is it's a cafeteria style and it's a sense of, it's, it's, it can be a little degrading. This bar opened their doors, let our clients come in for a free meal and served them the way they would serve any other patron in that restaurant. It was incredible to think that these people whose society is cast aside or insignificant could be treated and served. It was heart-wrenching. It was moving. And that bar, I don't know any of the staff, but they honored Jesus in that moment by flipping the system on its head and serving those who were least significant in our eyes. There are so many things you can do to elevate the insignificant in your life. Go out and do it. Jesus continues in his teaching. Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said. For no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose the reward. Once again, this temptation of comparison rears its ugly head in the disciples. But this time it's with an outsider. It is very probable that the disciples are still a little bitter from their previous failed exorcism just a few verses before. And so they see somebody who is succeeding and pride and jealousy inflames them. They were just regular people like us. And Jesus, once again seeing this as an absolutely essential skill they need to develop, tells them to promote unity. What they should have done in that moment, instead of stopping somebody who was doing kingdom work, 
is they should have checked their motives. They felt like they had a monopoly on the redeeming work of Christ because they were the closest to Jesus. They were the only ones who should be wielding this power. This man didn't violate any teachings of Jesus, not that we know of. All he did was prick their pride. And what a sore spot our pride is for most of us. On my camping trip, another skill we had to learn was fire building. And so he taught us how to go into the forest, break off dead branches from a tree, gather moss, create a fire bundle, light a fire inside, and then we had to keep it alive for 10 minutes. That's how you passed this skill test. So I went out and I did it. I had brought a barbecue lighter with me. And so I used my barbecue lighter to start this fire. My friend, Nick, brought matches. And so my fire lit up in, in, in just in a minute. It was really easy with the barbecue lighter. He sat there struggling with his matches as they would blow out from the wind and wouldn't light properly. And he looked at my fire that was thriving, and he was angry. You can tell there was some pride in that. You cheated. You used a barbecue lighter. It didn't help that I said, okay, I'll use your matches. Did the same thing. Pride in both of us inflamed. We had different methods. We both got the same results. It's very similar to what Jesus and his disciples encountered. Pride will crash any party if it can get an invite. There is no room for pride in a life that is following Jesus. This is one of the self-sins that needs to go. There's no room for Christ in the heart if the heart is filled with self. Pride comes directly from that ranking mindset I mentioned earlier. And as long as you are trying to rank yourself among your peers, you will always have to contend with the beast of pride. Always. They go hand in hand. And it is only by stepping out of that ranking system that you can overcome pride. It is only by turning it on its head like Jesus did with his disciples, and realizing the insignificant are actually more significant. And, truthfully, the system itself doesn't even matter. That's really the only way to deal with pride. And so this week, pay attention to where pride sneaks into your life, sneaks into your relationships, sneaks into your work, sneaks into your parenting. Because if you catch it, you can stop it. So look for it. And then it's really just a simple short prayer. Jesus, Spirit, help me control this pride. Help me to be humble. And this practice, as it's developed, will lead to more humility. Reinforced through the power of Christ. Short prayers are okay. Last week I kind of railed on short prayers, so I need to remind. Short prayers have a place. And it's right there. Catch your pride before it builds into something more. Jesus finished his teaching with these disciples with the following. If anyone causes one of these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them if a large millstone were hung around their neck and they were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life maimed than with two hands to go into hell where the fire never goes out. And if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell where the worms that eat them do not die, and the fire is not quenched. Everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Have salt among yourselves, 
and be at peace with each other. This last thing Jesus taught them was to cut off sin. And this text really speaks for itself with its visceral imagery. That is, until we water it down by saying it's not literal. I will, I will be clear off the start. Jesus is not telling you to cut off your hand, to gouge out your eye, or to cut off your foot. We know that not just because that would be extreme. We know this because Jewish law that Jesus lived under prohibited self-mutilation. So Jesus was using hyperbole, very visceral imagery, shocking hyperbole to get his point across. Jesus was an incredible communicator. He, knew, he knows, he knew when he was teaching how to really get at us. He knew that sin separates us from God. Not just the sin that we had before we became a Christian, before we were cleansed, before we were baptized, but the sin that we have still. The sin that we engage in every week. The sin that we put up with in our own lives separates us from God. And choosing to put up with sin in our lives is choosing to turn our back on God. And there are eternal consequences to those decisions. The last skill we had to learn was how to cook on a fire. And so our teacher said we had to bring chicken breast. He didn't choose steak, which we could have cooked medium rare and gotten away with. He chose chicken. Have you ever tried a medium rare chicken? Good. Even if that chicken was just a little undercooked, we risk disease. And you did not want to get that disease while you were out there in the bush, especially when you had to dig a hole every time. We had to cook the chicken all the way through. Getting rid of half the sin in your life is not enough. Jesus dealt with the consequences of our sin. Yes, that is the cross. We are not held guilty anymore because of what Jesus has done. But we still have the responsibility to find where sin is hiding in our lives and root it out, cut it off. There, there is no way we can look at what Jesus is saying here and put up with our pet sins and say, well, I'll deal with this later, or that's not that big of a deal. Jesus has already been addressing the pride in the disciples, the self-sins, selfishness, selfish ambition, etc., etc. Far too often we think, oh, we have a loving God. Oh, we have grace but we don't realize the gravity of sin. I've said this once, I'm going to say it again. Dietrich Bonhoeffer taught about cheap grace. Cheap grace is the grace that we get when we say, well, Jesus died for me, so my sins are forgiven, but we don't change our lives. Cheap grace is when we look at the cross and we say, thanks, Jesus, and we walk away. Real grace is when we're like the disciple John and we kneel at the cross and we cry and we weep because what our Savior had to go through. And if you have experienced that grace, you do not go back to your previous sin. Now that being said, I have sin I have to work on. You have sin you have to work on. And luckily, we are not judged because we continue to have this in our lives. But we need to cut it off. We don't need to do it alone. Through prayer, through reflection, you can identify the opportunities for sin in your life and then 
you have a community of brothers and sisters in Christ who are here to walk with you in it, to work with you through it. Whether it is a connection group, whether it is a trusted Christian relationship, we need to be salt. Salt that brings out the flavor, the goodness in each other. That was courtesy of Rick this week in our connection group. Through our community, through supporting each other, we help each other to overcome our sin. If we are vulnerable, if we are humble, if we are willing to work through it. Debbie mentioned another very insightful thing in our group this week as we looked at this passage. She, she told me eternal life means you have to give something up. During our meal, I had carried these, these camping pie irons, which is just, they're just a heavy piece of iron on the end of a stick. You clamp it down over two pieces of bread and jelly in the middle. And I carried those for three hours, should only have been 10 minutes, carried it for three hours so that on our chicken breast night, we could have these camping pies for dessert. It was amazing in the moment, but it was not worth it at all. What I should have done was just cast those away, given them up. My journey would have been so much better. We all have sin that we are holding on to that needs to be cast aside. The momentary indulgence of it may be sweet, but it is not worth the struggle. So cut it off. It is better to lose your hand than to burn in the fires of hell. It is better to gouge out your eye and go through life with one eye than to have two and burn in the fires of hell. It is better to cut off your foot and go through life maimed than to have two feet and turn your back on God. I'm going to call our worship team up at this point. But you remember my shelter, my little insignificant shelter compared to the grand palace that had been built across the way? Well, that night, while I was snug as a bug in a rug, camping, huddled close with my friends, their grand shelter collapsed. It was not structurally sound enough to last the night. It looked cool, but it was all show. Their shelter was just too big. They were fine. Okay, well, I should say this. They were fine. <laughs> they crawled out. They probably only had a bruised ego. But you are presented this morning with a choice. To build your life upon pride, exclusion, indulgence, or to value the insignificant to promote unity, and to intentionally guard purity. The former is a life that will collapse in on itself. It is not structurally sound enough to survive. But the life that is built on the teachings of Jesus, that life will continue for eternity. And really, it all comes down to the blood of the Lamb.